Jacinda Ardern. Thank you, Mr Chair. I know my other colleagues are eager to speak because there's um, <laughs> quite a lot to be said about the t taxation bright line test for residential land bill. And, and I concur absolutely uh, with those of my colleagues who have spoken previously and, and, and have outlined our hope that this bill uh, could have done more, but unfortunately has not, because no one on this side of the House is disputing the need for action when we have 50 plus percent of the Auckland population renting and the lowest home ownership rate since the 1950s. The fact that this bill has minority reports from every um, party in the House, I think demons almost, I believe, um, every party on the side of the House demonstrates um, uh, uh, the, the need for um, uh, there to be great debate on this bill and uh, to highlight the areas where it is lacking. I wanted to talk, though, Mr Chair, starting, uh, I wanted to speak uh, on the uh, regulatory impact statement and some of the uh, alternatives that it canvasses in terms of the definitions within this bill. It talks about the problem definition. It outlines that the government is concerned with high house prices, particularly in the Auckland area. It does highlight property speculation as one of the number of causes of the current um, prices and talks about other possible causes, both on supply and demand, and says that these are being separately considered. Six years later, these are still being separately considered. But on the problem definition around trying to target speculators, if that was the major objective of this a piece of legislation, then I am very confused by part, uh, part one, uh, clause four, which sets out the disposal within two years. It states an amount that a person derives from disposing of residential land is income of the person if the bright line date for the residential land is within uh, two years, and then sets out um, criteria that sits within, under that. As has been raised in the House, this appears to be totally arbitrary in terms of picking the two-year cut-off. So I wanted to have a little look in the regulatory impact statement to the justification for the two-year line. And what was the evidence that was brought to the table in order to determine that two years was the place that it needed to be? Uh, now, on page two of the regulatory impact statement, it talks about residential property churn. It says there is significant churn and short-term speculation in residential property, particularly in Auckland. Uh, it then goes on to state that there's particular evidence around churn for new titles and developments in Auckland. The evidence suggests from 2009 to 2013, 59% of all new titles were disposed of within a year, and 29% of new developments in North Auckland were traded within three months. Now, that probably speaks to the nature and arrangement of some of this property development. But when you look at existing residential properties and sale of dwellings within one year, two year, and three years, properties sold, existing properties sold within one year, eight, represented 8.4% of sales. Sales within two years represented 17.4%. Sales within three years represented 26.1%. Now, presumably, if you were genuinely trying to pick up churn amongst speculators, you would have been looking at the greatest reach. Now, that's actually supported, again, by the regulatory impact statement, which canvasses the various options and the cutoffs between, say, two years versus, say, uh, three to five years. Option one, with the two years, is highlighted as the option preferred by officials. Option two states, uh, option two, which looks at a, a, a longer period, over three to five years, it says this option would create a bright line similar to option one, however, with the period of the bright line being longer, potentially three or five years. This option has similar impacts as option one, but with greater effect owing to its longer period. It would, and this is the important part, it would best meet the objective of creating an easy to enforce rule and would have the greatest positive fiscal and administrative impact. However, this option is the greatest risk of capturing sales that were acquired without an intention of resale. Surely though, Mr Chair, the issue over whether or not you're capturing those that were intended for resale or not is not about necessarily an arbitrary timeline but around your use of definitions. Your definitions are what determines what's in and what's out, not just the timeline over a period of which someone um, uh, wishes to resell. So, Mr Chair, I want to come back to clause 
um, two, uh, and actually clause uh, six, which then talks about those definitions, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mr Chair. Which then goes on to talk about some of those definition issues, because it seems clear that if the primary objective is set out in the regulatory impact statement was indeed uh, around trying to ensure that we were cracking down on speculators and where there was the greatest churn, that actually they would have gone for a longer period. And that's the reason we're supporting the SOP before this House, which seeks to extend that period, because that would have the greatest impact. But again, issues around definition are particularly important. Now, I think it was um, the member from New Zealand first, Fletcher Tabato, who rightly pointed out uh, that there is a real contradiction when we're talking about trying to create certainty, because the regulatory impact, in fact, the minister's uh, commentary on the bill points out in the overview that the government announced plans to introduce a new land sale rule to, su to supplement so not to replace, but to supplement the intention test in the current land sales rules. The intention test makes gains from the sale of land taxable when bought with an intention uh, for the purpose of resale. This intention test is difficult to enforce due to its subjectivity. So one would assume that the bill in clause 6 should step away from any subjectivity. But in that clause, it talks about main uh, home exclusion. And the fact that within any disposal within two years does exclude the main home. But when you're looking at how the bill then defines main home, the main home exemption, as talked about in the commentary of the bill, states, as introduced, the bill would exempt a person's main home from the bright line test. Where a person has more than one home, the main home would be the one with which they have the greatest connection. Now, no wonder submissions uh, from the public, including from tax specialists, called this quote professionally confused. How do you, with clarity uh, and without the subjectivity that was uh, brought about by the intention test, how do you with clarity define uh, something that you have the greatest uh, uh, connection with. As someone has described, I think, previously, it's a bit like uh, the castle where you're talking about the vibe of the oh, thing, which is, which is uh, you know, how, otherwise, Chris Bishop, I'd be very happy for you to stand up and to give us a full explanation around how you define the greatest connection with a home. It's the, is, and is it in fact the vibe of the thing? Now let me come. Let me put a. Let me put in a. Uh, let me put a scenario uh, which would, which would be picked up by part one. If, for instance, oh, based on case law, so we have to go through courts to establish what Parliament is unable to define. That is poor law making, and the member knows it. And the member knows it. If accountants and lawyers are telling you. This will be tested in the court. You know you've made bad law in that sense. You know that you have. Because I would like to put a scenario to the member. If, for instance, uh, an individual is living in a home, goes on to purchase another home, chooses that they're going to probably dispose on that because it's made enormous capital gain, could they technically move into that home for the last three months before they dispose of it and claim a connection to that property as their residential property? Could that happen? I imagine it probably could, because this is an entirely, as I say, subjective test, and surely your connection is the fact that you are a resident within it, even if you're a resident within it for th a three-month period, a one-month period, purely in order to satisfy this completely subjective te uh, test that has been set out before us. So, Mr Speaker, that's something that we, I would welcome the Minister clarifying for me whether that scenario that I've put forward could reasonably could reasonably demonstrate connection to a residential property, even if they had an additional property that they were then tenanting, which was their prior residential property. Because I think that points out the problem with the definitions. And as we've stated, the regulatory impact statement was saying that longer periods would pick up a greater amount of churn, then surely part of the issue was actually the definitions rather than necessarily um, the period of cutoff. So, Mr Speaker, I'd like, um, I would like some uh, members from the other side of the House to stand up and tell me how that will make a difference. I'd also like to highlight that within the regulatory impact statement, Mr um, Chair, the fact that they are talking about the fact under the fiscal impacts that, quote, <coughs> that it would be difficult to quantify the fiscal uh, impact of the two-year Brightline test, uh, 
because of the number of sales that would be delayed in order to exceed the two-year holding period. Officials are acknowledging that the system will be gamed by speculators to simply get around this flawed bill. And Mr Chair, that is a complete lost opportunity when we have a housing crisis in Auckland.